Hello and welcome to another panel discussion. Today we're going to talk about sales call planning, uh, a subject that uh, you know needs to be revisited on a regular basis because it's something that everybody knows they should do, but sometimes it uh, it uh, gets pushed to the side. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by a great panel of experts who are going to discuss the the subject of sales call planning. So if you have questions during the uh, during the broadcast, you know please uh, put them in the question box, and I'll uh, and I will put them. I will pose them to the panelists uh, as we go through. So. Rather than me read out the bios, I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. So maybe, uh, Catherine, if you'd like to start. Yes. Hi, my name is Catherine Brinkman, and I am the president and daily multi-hat wearer of BHY Consulting. We focus on sales, leadership, and also presentations consulting and training. I've worked in sales for many, many years, and I firmly believe that prepping your sales call is probably 75% of the battle, if not at least 50%. So excited to be here and field your questions and talk more about this. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Catherine. And Dan, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, Dan Perry, a partner here at the Brevet Group. And the Brevet Group is a sales strategy and sales enablement consulting firm. Uh, but like Catherine, I've worked in sales for, geez, I'm dating myself, but 20, 28 <laughs> years now. Uh, and all kinds of uh, sales rep, sales leader, global accounts guy, sales chief revenue officer of multi-billion dollar organizations. And sales call planning is the fundamental way to actually execute a sales interaction. Uh, so I'm anxious to talk about that. Excellent. And our third panelist is Ken Thorson, who will be joining us shortly. He's having a couple of technical difficulties, but we are going to move on anyway. And what I wanted to do is just quickly before we start is do a quick poll here just to see what kind of role you are. Uh, what, what's your role? So we get an idea of the people who are on the um, who are on the uh broadcast here. So if you would like, please just select uh, the most appropriate role from the quick poll there. Um, so it gives us an idea of the audience we are addressing today. Uh, so I'm just going to keep this open for a, a few more moments. Uh, really looking forward to this discussion today because it is, I think sales call planning is one of the most fundamental uh, tools that a salesperson has to be a, a leading indicator of success and an organization. So, okay, we nearly have everybody who has voted so far. I'm going to close the poll in just one moment. Have you got a couple of seconds here? Okay. All right. I'm going to close the poll, um, share the results. There you go. So we have a uh, majority of people on the call are either in sales um, or sales operations or in executive leadership. Excellent. Okay. All right. So without any uh, further ado, let's uh, get right into the discussion itself. Okay, so I know you both alluded to this earlier, but let's uh, go a little deeper. Um, and Catherine, maybe if you want to kick this off. So why is sales planning so important? It's important so you really have that backstop to understand and realize what's the actual dominant buying motive of your client coming up with some value summaries that you think may interest them prior so you can fall back on those as well as just doing your research on who the people are within the company that may be top decision makers and see what connections you may have to them already so you can build rapport really quickly. Excellent. And what about you, Dan? What's your perspective on why sales call planning is so important? Yeah, so we, we, we like to think of it as uh, when you have a, a, an important interaction or a major interaction with a customer, that that major interaction can advance the sale or, quite frankly, if done poorly, derail or lose the sale and those major interactions are so important to plan for 
and, and, and making sure that, to Catherine's point, right, you understand customers' expectations and you, you have your objectives and expectations of the call as well, too. You craft an agenda for this as well, too, this interaction. You, you make sure that you address any customer business issues or customer engagement that, that you want, right? You are actually setting the stage and the foundation so you to accomplish what you want to want to achieve in the sales call because we all know sales calls get derailed really quickly mm-hmm. if you're not if you're not planning those appropriately um you know ab- absolutely um, i agree with both of what you said and uh, and i guess it goes back to that old adage you know you um, uh, fail to plan you know plan to fail um, I think it's a, it's a critical it's a critical piece and probably one of the most fundamental pieces of selling. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. Um, so so maybe on that point, let's discuss a little bit about what are some of the obstacles. You know, why do many salespeople still not do it do it well, or somebody or some of them not do it at all? Like, what what do you think is the the root cause of that, uh, Dan? Yeah, so the, the reason why some salespeople still don't do it, and then and then and the reason why they don't do it well, uh, is the salespeople when they first start in sales, you know, you go to your sales skills training class, onboarding class, whatever you want to call it, and in call planning is taught to you that you need to prepare for your call. So I'm a new salesperson, I want to impress my boss, I want to do things right, I'm gonna plan my sales call. And then what happens is uh, you tend to get busy. You get overwhelmed with a number of different things to do. And you've executed a sales call pretty well. And you think in the back of your mind, well, I'm planning for the call in my mind anyway. <laughs> so so I don't need to write anything down. I don't need to to really hash that. It's in my mind and I'm going to execute it. And I've done it before in the past. So that means I can do it again. And I don't need to truly really plan for this. And what unfortunately what happens is when you don't actually write it down, what you want to accomplish, you don't achieve it. And when you don't achieve those things, the sales cycle length increases. And really you talk about sales cycle length, even if you sell the deal, it's going to take you longer to sell the deal because you're forgetting things that you need to go back now and ask for and, uh, uh, and that you could have accomplished on the first sales call. Excellent. And what about you, uh, Catherine? Why do you think many salespeople still don't do it well or, or even do it at all? I completely agree with Dan and the fact that if you don't do it, you're hindering your sales process, you're limiting your credibility. I think part of it's a fear factor. It's kind of like, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this account. It seems like it's a tough sell. So why should I invest the time to even do the pre-call? And what people should realize and why they should do it is that there are going to be trends within the industries and the various companies they're consulting with and selling. So when you do the pre-call approach, Maybe you don't land that deal right away. It doesn't mean in the future you won't be working with another client that has similar challenges. There you go. You have some idea already of what they could be facing. It really is a fear issue in getting over that and spending that five, ten minutes to just do the, the research on what the key issues are and then drill down to what questions you would ask really can make a deal. Mm-hmm. And what do you think? And do, do you both um, think it's also, you know, it's a factor. You just mentioned spending the time there. I, I, I think you know nowadays everybody's you know they've got their calendar tools, they've got their CRM, they've got everything they they need, all the tools they need to plan out their time and manage their time effectively. But it seems to me like a lot of salespeople will you know have the meeting booked and, and planned on their calendar, but not the prep time for it. Um, is that something that you see that they they forget that there's it's not just the meeting itself they should be allocating time for that planning itself is that something you think is an issue too either of you yes absolutely right um, you listen you <laughs> what's important to you I can look in your calendar and figure out what's important to you right where you spend your time is what is how what's your priorities right and if you don't spend time planning for a sales call you just show up. And you send to wing it, and you think you can, you're expert enough to do that. You're not. You're, it's not important to you. And when that's not important to you, uh, you actually can derail yourself in that sales call and lose the deal. If you don't have a competitive strategy, if you don't know what what the competition is, you don't know where the buyers are in the buying process. You even don't know who's coming to the sales call from the customer standpoint and what their personas are and how you speak to those personas and what are they're important to them. All of those things factor in the fact of good planning. And I have numerous stories 
where even myself blew it off, didn't plan it for a call, and burnt my hand on the stove. <laughs> yeah, that's a good hey, I think we all have stories. Hey John, uh, John, this is Ken Thorson. I finally got on the call. Thank you very much for having invited me. Oh, great, Ken. Excellent. Good, good. Um, Ken, we were just um, we were just talking about uh, the importance of sales call planning, but also why is it that so many salespeople still don't do it well or even do it at all? What's your perspective on that? Well, coming from um, my perspective, I always remember that one of the first calls I made where I went out with a senior salesperson and we talked on the way about sports and a lot of events and we got to the particular a client and I was a very young salesperson at that point and we're about to go in and all of a sudden he stopped and he said, so what, how are we going to open? Hmm. How are we going to close? What's the objective of the call? What if he says this? What if he does that? And he did it on purpose to drive a point. And my point is, the reason most people aren't very effective at it is the sales manager has not structured the sales training to a point of preparation. Uh, the comments we were just talking about of making sure that you're prepared is really key, but it's really understanding that that time on stage with that client, you have to separate yourself from the competition. And, and we were talking about preparation is there. It's really about rehearsing the call, but not having the sales manager training them effectively to understand the importance of that. And that, that's my, my element. They don't have a checklist, a mm -hmm. pre-call planning, and they don't have the discipline to be able to be, to be prepared for that call. Excellent. And um, I'm glad you could join us, Ken. Um, so is sales call planning a leading indicator of success? So I really want to dig into the, in, the importance of it because in, in a previous life, you know, when I, when I ran Hathaway, we did a lot of training. Um, you know, we trained salespeople around the globe, but we always spent a lot of time on sales call planning because we believe fundamentally that if uh, you could get people doing this effectively, it was actually one of the leading indicators of success. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Catherine? Like Ken, I learned the hard way. Um, one of my first sales calls, I thought, okay, whatever. It's a lead that was inbound. It's contact us. I'll go out, talk to them. And it wasn't until I was in the car with my sales manager that kind of threw me in the deep end mm -hmm. where she said, what do you know about this company? We're in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about the company. The first, and I thought, oh, I'll wing it, whatever. Mm -hmm. The first question he asked, he was the CEO of a large semiconductor company, and the first question he asked was, what do you know about us? <laughs> and obviously I knew nothing. Um, so it, it really, that stung me so deeply that as a result, I always do the pre-approach. I at least know what the current presses of the company, who the current leaders are. So then if I am asked, okay, well, what do you know about us? What are we currently working on? Then I can answer. To that point even more, I think a lot of us are working with big companies mm -hmm. or we work with people that have, we have these relationships that go a few years. Some companies have those earnings calls. Some companies go so far as on those earning calls, they're literally let you know what money is being allocated to what department, what the initiatives are. I'm always on those calls. It's an hour out of my day once a quarter. Right. And I've sold, I've gotten into other departments because of that. So does that hinge on your success? Definitely. Excellent. And what are your thoughts on that, Ken? Leading indicator of success if you do it properly? Um, I might disagree, um, and only from the fact of the definition of what is a leading indicator. Um, certainly making call preparation and making X number of calls is important, but I think a leading, and everybody has to do that, but a leading indicator, and using that as the, the defining term in this question, I guess, mm -hmm. that a leading indicator is something that I do that will eventually close the sale. And I think a leading indicator effectively from a sales leadership perspective, really looking at it from a vice president's sales perspective, is something a little bit further down the line. I may need to make X number of calls per week, but I really need to do X number of specific activities further down the road in the sales cycle uh, and do them well. That will be the leading indicator to generate either the proposal or the quote that eventually will lead to the sale. Certainly if I screw up the initial sales call or I screw up the second or third sales call, 
because I'm not prepared for it, that will certainly impact future success. But I think other activities down the road are what I would call leading indicators from that perspective. Sales calls are important and, and planning for them are key because at any point in time where you destroy your trust and confidence between you and that suspect or prospect, I think you will screw up your leading, uh, your success factor. But I, I look at other things versus just sales call planning as leading the indicators. Yeah, no, it's one. It, it's um, it is uh, it it is one um, indicator. We actually used to measure the fact that after training, that if you looked at those who effectively sales call plan against those who you know cursory sales calls plan, there was that was actually a, an indicator of further success. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Yeah, um, Dan, what's your what's your thoughts on on uh, whether doing this right can be a leading indicator of success? So to your to Ken's point about leading indicators, there's a lot of leading indicators of success, but sales call planning is a fundamental thing that you must do to actually plan for the call. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a small company or a large company, you need to know who's in the room. You need to know what's what what who the account is what the objective of each person in the room is what the objective of the corporate strategy of the account you didn't know those things that are really important and i can give you an example of where uh, because we purposely planned for this sales call and we spent the time to make sure that we knew everyone in the room we knew everyone that was happening we knew the objectives we knew what we wanted to accomplish we knew three sales calls from now what 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 they're going to be asking for to try to address that and improve or improve the sales cycle length uh, all of those things it was we literally we were negotiating a 300 million dollar deal in the, in the government of chile for aramark food services and i was in santiago chile and we spent a full day planning that sales call Mm -hmm. And because we did that, we knew everything that happened. I knew the procurement's family, what the children were like, the the the, the uh, Secretary of Interior and what he wanted to accomplish out of this call. We knew what food they liked. We ordered the right food for the sale. I mean, we did everything perfectly and we sold that deal. And if we had not planned like that, we would have not been successful. And my sales guys were going crazy. They were killing me. They're like, why do you want to do this? This is overkill. This is overkill. And I probably said to them, you are a professional salesperson. This is your job. You've chosen this profession. Just like a surgeon or a, or a lawyer, attorney chooses their profession. You need to be professional. I mean, a surgeon doesn't walk in the operating room and says, what do we got today? Or an attorney <laughs> doesn't walk into the courtroom and say, hey, what's going on? Mm -hmm. They are extremely thoughtful in what they're doing. You need to do the same thing. And if you don't do that, I don't want you on my team. Yeah. 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 Well done. Yeah, I, I I love that, and that the uh, and the idea, you know, that that um, you know, it doesn't have to be a three hundred million dollar deal in order to do that. Um, and I, I I totally agree with you, and I think that that it boils down to fundamentals, as you say, uh, professionalism. And I think uh, everybody on the panel would agree is that yeah, you as a salesperson, you have to treat it as a profession. You have to say, I'm a sales professional, and I should be prepared. Um, so let's talk about, uh, and, and again, you alluded to this earlier, so maybe you want to kick off this one. What role should sales managers play in sales call planning? So that to me? Uh, I said they, to Ken, uh, Ken. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Go ahead, Ken. No, that's great. Uh, it's a great story you just told. Uh, I think that's really the role uh, and I, I, of sales leadership. And the phrase I use is inspect what you expect. Mm -hmm. So if, as a sales manager, you have to inspect what you expect the salespeople to do. So sales managers really need to uh, go out with the salespeople, see what they're doing, but really inspect, are they prepared? Not make sure they're prepared, but find out if they're prepared. And there's a big difference there is that sales managers really are very important, not only in training and coaching, but inspecting. And that's really the question, and we or the point we were talking about is, do you what do you know about this company? Now, that was a great comment. What do you know about the company? What do you think the competition's doing? Uh, what how are we going to open the call? What who's going to do the middle of the call? What's the close of the call? And what's the objective of the call? Those kinds of questions and inspections will make sure the salespeople are always prepared when the sales manager is not with them. And I think that's an important element in my mind. 
Excellent. And what about you, Catherine? What role do you think sales plan managers should play in sales call planning? To start, like Ken said, they should be really involved. After maybe two months, they shouldn't be as involved. They're not supposed to be babysitting. So if the salesperson comes to the manager and says, hey, I'd like your help, that's fantastic. Um, if the sales numbers drop and closing ratio drops, the manager should go have a one-on-one -on -one and role play. Asking questions is great, but if you ask a closed-ended question in a discovery phase, you just shut the door. So making sure that the open-ended questions are pointed, direct, and really hitting the needs of the potential client are indicative to closing a sale. <laughs> And and Dan, uh, that was a uh, again, that was a great story you told. But what other, what else should a sales manager be doing in in sales call planning? Most important position in the sales force is, is the sales manager. Yeah, make or break your make or break your sales by, by the sales manager and the quality of the coaching of the sales manager. And what happens is we find is sales managers don't coach. They all say they want to coach. Everybody's <laughs> on board, but they just don't do it. And the reason why they don't do that is because they don't make the time to coach. You need time to coach. And coaching is not telling, coaching is really collaborative discussion with, with the salesperson. And a call plan allows you that time to coach. Mm -hmm. So if, a fee, if the sales manager is riding in the field with their salesperson, the call plan is an excellent way to help prepare for that call and coach that salesperson on, you know, not only did you do it, but what's the quality of your call planning? Did you write under the back of a cocktail napkin at the bar the night before? Or did you really try go into and, and do some really thoughtful planning? And that's where a sales manager can do that. However, to Catherine's point, you can't babysit someone's. So it's an initial kind of situational coaching where if you're new, you've got to be teaching. If you're not performing, you're directing. But if you're actually you know, well performing, you're spot checking on important major interactions to make sure that the call is the sales call planning is quality planning. Yeah, and I think that's great. I think the I think one of the, the key elements there and you're right on is that in our sales manager boot camps or the, the training courses we do, we always teach the sales managers to ask this question after every sales call. If you had to do it over again, what would you do differently, if anything? And we drill the sales managers into asking that phrase so that when the, the sales manager isn't with the salesperson, the salesperson asks themselves, if I had it to do over again, what would I do differently, if anything? Because that's what's the self-generation or the self-improvement process from a coaching perspective that's critical. Yeah, yeah, and to Ken, to your point, that's fantastic because that's where you're taking that babysitting piece out. Um, I know myself as a top performer within Dale Carnegie for a number of years, I literally was trained as a salesperson. You ask, what would you do differently? What did you like? What questions did you ask that you would then rephrase to get a stronger answer? So I rarely had to go to my sales manager and they love me for that because I wasn't a thorn in their side being trained to ask that. So to your point, that's fantastic that you train your sales managers to do that. Yeah, I love that, that whole, because I think at the end of the day, it's all about, uh, you know, empowering and, uh, you know, getting your, your sales professionals to, you know, hold themselves to the, to the standards and to be self, you know, critiquing. And one other thing, Dan, that you mentioned earlier about, you know, what's important to somebody can be reflected on their calendar. I think obviously from a sales manager point of view, if you're not putting uh, coaching time on your salesperson's calendar, you're, you're basically telling them how important it isn't right yeah correct <laughs> yes okay so um, um we just touched on this but I, th I think it's a good thing to revisit is uh you know so should should sales call plans be reviewed after sales calls see how effective they were whether the outcome was it was achieved so i mean this goes into um, you know, how much planning you put in before, uh, how detailed your sales call plan is, and then afterwards coming back and looking at it. So what should what should salespeople do and what should they be looking for when they review how the, how the sales call went? Uh, maybe Catherine, if you want to kick off that one. Sure. I mean, the top thing to really look at is did you close? What was the next step that you determined? Are you happy with that next step? But also more importantly is to determine – 
the buyer type. So one of the things I've focused on throughout my sales career is really pinpointing, are they an executive buyer, a technical buyer, what questions work for them? And then I, I really do create a script when I am doing emails to have those value summaries that worked when I was in those past sales calls. But the focus is reviewing and determining what was the buyer type, what questions resonated, body language. That has helped me move forward and know what buyer types I can push faster and close faster and what buyer types maybe I'm not going to sell them. I know that, so I'll hand it off to a colleague and they can go in and close. Esther, what about you, Dan? What would you look for when you um, review uh, a plan after the meeting to see how, how it unfolded? Yeah, so I'm looking for um, did we achieve all the objectives of, this, of the call plan? Did the customer achieve their objectives or expectations? Did we achieve our objectives and expectations? Did we follow some kind of agenda? Did we get side railed and tracked? And then more importantly, did we advance the sale in their sales methodology? You know, are we using a sales methodology? If we are, what's the next step? Did we achieve what we wanted to try to achieve? Uh, this is classic feedback mm -hmm. that that when you when you give uh, when you review a call plan after the sales call, and this doesn't have to happen with the sales manager. A great sales A player sales reps do this themselves, and they re review their sales call and they say, "Did I actually do the job that I was supposed to?" Or do we get sidetracked? Did the customer want to do something different? And if I if I did get sidetracked, did I bring the call back around to what my objectives were out of this interaction with the customer? So yeah, they need to be reviewed. Unfortunately, a lot of times you don't because what happens is you're on the next call, right? Mm -hmm. You're on the next customer, yeah. right? And you don't take a little bit of time to to, to review that and get and get some feedback. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think that's a great point. Uh, and uh, when you're rushing off to the next call, and um, later on, when you if you even have time later on to come back to doing the review, you're doing it a little bit removed from the event, and that always allows some subjectivity to come into play. Um, Ken, what are your thoughts? Uh, how should you review a sales call plan after the fact? Depending upon the size of the organization, uh, I have a couple different takes on this because mm -hmm. uh, if I'm remote sales reps, I'm in the office with five other people or 50 other salespeople, um, there's two approaches I take on this idea. Um, while a salesperson could go make a sales call, he or she goes, well, that was great. I made everything I moved. I moved forward. And I got, got this done. Da, 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 da. But what I recommend with most sales organizations is that either we team up two salespeople and at least twice a week, they meet to review their sales calls, what's going on, what happened on that sales call, and they self judge each other based upon seniority, junior, mm -hmm. senior type of thing. And, or in a sales meeting, I recommend that the sales manager discusses various calls in the sales meeting. And they may pick them randomly, or if they were on a sales call with someone and, and want to review Dan's sales call or John's sales call or Catherine's sales call, and they actually discuss that call in the meeting, what happened, what was the outcome, what was your objective, what issues came up, how did you handle it, and use them as a learning curve, uh, that's a very effective way to do it. But getting salespeople to team up and meet on a regular basis two or three people at a time to talk about sales calls. It allows almost a mini peer group to begin to be able to judge how well they did. Having an individual salesperson grade themselves on a sales call can be good or bad based upon the professionalism of that salesperson. Yeah, good point. Based upon the uh, level of self-awareness and uh, professionalism. But I think uh, I, I like what you just said, Ken, because I think having some peer-to-peer -peer, uh, review and peer-to-peer -peer interaction is, is always good. Uh, I think salespeople um, learn a lot from each other. I, I think uh, when that's facilitated, that can be very powerful. Um, okay, so let's move on to, and let, let's try and get a little uh, down into the weeds here and talk about some of the best practices for sales call planning. And maybe um, what might be interesting if uh, for each of you to describe what a sales call plan looks like for you, because, um, you know, I've seen different people, uh, they plan different things. Some people 
um, you know, do very comprehensive. Some people focus in on, on particular areas. So um, maybe, Dan, if you wanted to start this and uh, and talk about what, what does a sales plan look like from your point of view and what are some of the best practices that you think for for compiling a, a good sales call plan and what should go into it? So we mentioned a lot of these already. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, like, you know, what what <laughs> – What's the company do? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, not, but more importantly, how do they make money? Because mm-hmm. if you, and it depends on, on who you're, you're talking to. So you have to first plan the sales call around the people that you're actually calling on. Right. Uh, a, a chief human resource officer is going to have a different set of objectives, desires, wants, and metrics than obviously a CIO or a CEO. So you have to first determine who you're calling on. What do they do? How does that company make money? And then what does that role or the person do inside of that company and how do they contribute? How do they get paid if possible? What, what, how do they get judged? Right. And there, that's what they're concerned about. And then you set up your, your expectations of what the customer wants out of this meeting. And obviously, I mentioned this before, but what we want out of the meeting, mm-hmm. you have to craft some kind of agenda. You might, and then a great sales call would be to send that agenda prior to the to the interaction to make sure that the customer understands that. What are the business issues? Identifying the you know the business issues that the customer wants, and 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 how do you open the meeting and get interest? And and who's attending from your side? And what's their roles inside of this? You know, a lot of times we work with a lot of software companies and they have a pre-sales person or a systems engineer involved in a demonstration. How do you position the demo? When does that person talk? I mean, what, what's crafted? It's a kind of sometimes a performance yeah. that you have to plan for, right? Um, next steps. A lot of times we, we leave sales calls saying, this is the customer says, this is great. Let's <laughs> get together again. And we never plan the call. And it takes an extra two weeks to get the next meeting on the, on the books, right? right? Those are just some of the basics right around the best practices for sales call plan. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. No, I love that idea. I think um, one of the most important things there that you highlighted is uh, the idea of defining, of defining roles about the people who you're going to be meeting. Uh, because in most, um, you know, complex sales, there's more than one person involved in the, in the purchase, what their role is, um, what, what's important to them. Um, so you're addressing people differently. And, and also the other part you said about the roles of, uh, of the sales team taking part in the, the call, because there's nothing worse than if there's, you know, maybe two or three people on your side and people are tripping over each other or interrupting each other, or it's going askew. I think that it's, it's critical. I've always seen that it's critical to plan in advance, you know, who, what role you're going to play when you're going to speak, what are you going to address as opposed to somebody else? So, um, you know, Ken, from your point of view, what do you, what are some of the best practices for planning a sales call? I totally agree with what's been said at that point. In our template that we use, mm-hmm. we work with a lot of technology and engineering kind of companies. And knowing who's how the dance is going to go is critical, as you said, and, and having that checklist of ideas. In fact, a lot of times we make sure the salesperson has completed the pre-call planning checklist before right. allocating a technical resource for them to make the call. So I think that's an important element to, to think about. One of the things that's a little bit different is, and it goes back to training and education, is we'll use case studies in our training programs a lot of times to say, okay, here's a case study, here's a situation. Okay, you're going to go make a call on the CIO, or you're going to make a sales call on the CFO. What do you need to know? And what do you need? What do you know from the case study? What else do you need to know? And and that helps the best practices, frankly. Uh, execute more effectively because they've gone through a pre-study of a case study before they have to make that call. But I think it's it, the only other thing I think I would add is that understanding why customers buy from your prospect is an important element. And one of the phrases I always also use is in preparation for that call is, has anything changed? since the last time we got together and understanding that because you can plan like crazy for any sales call. And I think that's important. But when you walk in, if you're following your plan and all of a sudden something has changed that you weren't aware of, your plan has to change on the spot. Mm -hmm. And so asking that simple question up front, has anything changed since the last time we met? 
is an important element for the salesperson to know in their preparation for that call. Exactly. Um, and, and Catherine, what are your thoughts on some best practices for sales call planning? Like Dan mentioned, what are they going to get? Really determining what's that return on investment. That is so critical because all of a sudden, if you can convey that you can solve their problem and get them that return on investment, the price of your product doesn't matter. It goes out the window. And the best way to determine how and what their ROI is expected is questioning. Asking, like Ken mentioned, what's changed? Being able to really ask those open-ended questions throughout where are they currently, what's a roadblock, where do they want to be. To Dan's point as well, it really does separate sales people from sales professionals in regards to sending that silly little agenda 24 hours in advance. I had a situation where um, it was Samsung and I emailed 24 hours in advance and I said, you know, here's the agenda. Who else will be joining us? I like to personalize these things. I want to make sure the people in the room know I know their name, that I know a little bit about them. So I'll include their name on the agenda. That little question, who else will be joining us? Mm-hmm. One person was not discussed earlier. So if I just sent that agenda and not asked that question in the pre-plan, I would have showed up to in a meeting with a copy of an agenda with someone left out. Right. So just those little nuances, those little questions, and really sending that agenda to get them to think, okay, wait a minute, yeah, I have this meeting, number one. I think all of us have shown up and someone's like, oh, I totally forgot. That agenda 24 hours really sets the tone that you're serious that you're a professional, that you've put some time into this, and you're having that prospect or the current client, if you're going back in to sell them something else, let them know, okay, think about what do you want from me in our time? Yeah, uh, no, I, 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 I think that's a great point, and certainly it's a great point also about m- – doing your best to not be surprised. So like you say, you not be surprised when somebody else is in the room that you weren't expecting. Uh, I think one other one other point just to add to this in a best practice is, you know, when you do a sales call plan, uh, obviously you're going to have an outcome in mind. Uh, but you also need to have some fallback outcomes because uh, let's face it, you often don't get the the outcome that you would like to get, but you have to have a next best one and even one behind that because that's the one of the things that I've seen over the years that falls down in many sales call plans that it has a single outcome that you're going for. And if you don't achieve that, then it's a bit of a scramble to figure out how to get uh, how to get something that still moves the sale forward. So I think having a having more a, 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 a desired a preferred outcome and then a backup outcome is is a good uh, thing to have uh, somebody asked here in the chat here's a good question because t- can you re- uh, you uh, refer to a template somebody asked here you know should every sales organization have a a set call plan that people fill out so should everybody have a uniform sales plan is that a best practice what do you think Ken I think uh, it depends on a couple of things. And let me, first of all, address your, your previous point. It is a chess game. Mm-hmm. And the mental toughness of the, and the creativity of the salesperson is very critical. So you talked about having a, a fallback plan and a secondary plan. It is a chess game. You got to think about the moves and you need to be thinking two moves ahead. So I agree with your point. Um, but going back to your question, depending upon the size of the transaction that you're in, If you are on a weekly sales cycle, or if you're on a six-month sales cycle, your template would change Mm -hmm. and your actions in complexity will change. So even if I am going in and it's a one-call close or it's a two-call close, um, I should have a pre-call five questions I want to think about. Mm -hmm. Um, If I'm in on a six-month sales cycle, it's $300,000, whatever it might be. I'm going to be a little bit more concerned because I got more on the table, but I also have a more complex number of players, but absolutely a template or a worst case, a checklist. Um, I think that's very important to have because if you execute more effectively, you will win more often. And the key between real success and not success is how well you execute. And that's really the job of sales leadership 
is to make sure the sales team exec is executing brilliantly. Right. And um, Dan, what about you? Do you um, do you recommend the use of a of a template? Yeah, I do recommend the use of a template. And the reason why is everyone, uh, veterans, I should say, you know, and obviously new salespeople need that that template to, to form, get their opinions. But veterans tend to skip things. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say they're lazy. They just tend to skip things. And with a template, it, uh, it kind of keeps you honest. And what I mean by honest is make sure that you answer the questions or it triggers things that you might not have thought of or that you might be going too fast and, and blown off. So a, a template for the organization helps ground the organization and what's the, what's the best practice. Uh, and knowing that most people will then want to uh, live up to that best practice and be sure they plan thoroughly. Or if they don't plan thoroughly or they don't fill out the template all the way, there's a reason why. So yes, a, an advocate of that, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Dan. I do think uh, uh, I think it's uh, it, it's human nature in any job you do when you've been doing it for a while, you do start to maybe unconsciously take shortcuts. So I think having a having a template to keep you honest is a great idea. And what about you, Catherine? Have you would you advocate the use of a, a uniform template? Most definitely. Again, going back to identifying what those buyer types are, when you come together at a sales meeting and you really review, okay, what worked for you, what didn't, as a group, when I'm facilitating sales training for these people, they can come to a conclusion that certain questions are really working. They can ask those time and time again. Um, an anecdotal story would be there was a company that um, our, our, com- our organization at the time I was working for was asked to not come back. And I was very self-conscious. I inherited that account. I went back in a few years later and I literally had the questions written out. I had everything pre-planned, the template that we would use. I had that out. The gentleman took the plan he answered the questions. He wrote in the answers mm-hmm. for me. And the whole time I'm like, I was so nervous to give <laughs> it to him. But at the end of the day, he took control of that meeting. He looked at me as I left and he said, you really did the time to plan. I appreciate that. Just so you know, invoice us. <laughs> That's when I was locked. So it seems uncomfortable. Maybe you feel like, oh, I'm too seasoned. That was 11 uh, years into my sales career. That was six years into my career with Dale Carnegie, again, as a top producer. And I was always very nervous to do that. But I finally tried it. And then it became rote, even though I still do it today. I'll have it with me. If they want it, great. They have it. Oh, that's a great story. Um uh, here's another actually. Here's another. Fa- <laughs> this is an interesting question. Uh, can you over plan and, and get too bogged down in the plan? And uh, maybe, um, uh, Catherine, you want to take that one? We'll go through um, the other two. But that's an interesting question. <laughs> I will say 100% yes. Um, when you're in outside sales and you're working on cold calling, you don't have time to sit and spend 30 minutes looking at each company. So yes, if it's a current client or it's someone that you know very well, um, then plan. If you set that original meeting after the cold call, remember when you're cold calling, your win is to actually set the next meeting. Um, so if you're if you're actively cold calling and your goal is to get those meetings, you're on the phone for two hours and that's your block time, and then all of a sudden you find that you're spending 30 minutes per company, you're not going to hit your numbers when you're cold calling. Yeah. And um, what do you think, Dan? Can you over plan or get too bogged down in the whole planning part? That's why you need a template. Uh-huh. Because sometimes you uh, can over plan and really lose sight of what the objective is, is to go sell a deal. So <laughs> uh, by using a template, uh, you can, it, it, it prevents both making sure you don't forget anything to, the, to our point earlier, but also make sure you don't over plan. Yeah. And, and what's your thoughts quickly, Ken, on that, on the over planning piece? And a little bit depends upon where you are in the cycle uh-huh. of the sale. Certainly if I'm higher end, you know, as, as Catherine was talking about in cold calling, there's one issue there. But if I'm walking into a board meeting with six people um, and I have two people with me or one person with me and it's down to a proposal presentation, um, you've got to make sure I'm well planned in each of those phases. Uh, and certainly you can over plan. 
But the advantage of overplanning, frankly, is just the whole idea of rehearsing. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to rehearse your presentation, you want to make sure you rehearse it because I know when I do keynote programs, I have to be really on. And for that one hour presentation, I may spend four or five hours rehearsing for that to make sure it comes off well. Um, over planning allows you to anticipate objections, anticipate what happens, and be able to have answers so that when they raise an issue, your jaw doesn't drop. Hmm. So it depends on where you are in the sales cycle as far as how much time you want to spend and, and what the anticipation issue of, of your ability to uh, address the objections and address the salient points. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's uh, I think it's always good to earn the side of being thorough. Uh, but if you're doing it to the point where it's uh, impacting your ability to actually execute, then you've probably um, gone over right. the line. <laughs> All right, then. Um, in the last few moments here, um, I'd like to give you uh, each of you an opportunity um, for a last insight around call planning. Any aspect of call planning that you wanted to share? Um, maybe Catherine, do you want to start? off yeah sure an interesting point that I observed in the call is people need to realize that there are different plans for different stages in different mm -hmm. roles within sales so being able to define a template for each should be part of the sales managers responsibility and then having that salesperson it becoming rote for them it's part of their process defining what are the key takeaways is also part of the plan. So then you don't just get discouraged. Mm -hmm. Making sure that you have attitude that coincides with what it takes to be a, a top sales producer is key, and planning is a part of that. So really having the template, having the sales manager involved in the practicing, like Ken mentioned, being able to coach. So doing the role play, and then coming more from a salesperson's point of view and as a consultant, salespeople need to be able to ask questions of themselves and put themselves in their prospective buyer's shoes. So what do they expect the client to ask? What do they expect the other person at the end of that table to want to know? It really, it, it's flexibility mm -hmm. and it's an awareness of what do you want at the end of the day for that customer, that prospect across the table to get from you, what's their win as well. Excellent. And Ken, uh, a last insight from you. I think really as a salesperson, when you recognize that you're going to make five sales calls, seven sales calls on a particular prospect and recognizing that 30 minutes or that one hour that you have needs to be thought out well enough so you separate yourself from the competition is critical. Recognize that before you went in and see that prospect, he or she was thinking about something totally unrelated to you, whatever you're trying to sell them. And as soon as you walk out of that room, he or she will be thinking about something unrelated to your, <laughs> your product or service that you're selling. You really need to think through what impression you're going to have on that suspect prospect in that 30 minute, one hour, four hour sales call that you have to make. So you separate yourself from the competition. Uh, one last idea that I would throw out is I was trained that whenever I made a sales call, I always left something for the prospect to do for me mm -hmm. so that I was on their to-do list. So that's just another little hint that I would throw out there. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a critical one. I'm glad you raised that, Ken. And um, what about you, Dan, the last insight? Yeah, all great stuff by my esteemed colleagues here. I would say that the, 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 the one insight that I would have is just do it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, that's perfect. <laughs> Perfect. All right, then, uh, just quickly before we go, uh, Dan, why don't you start? Just let everybody know how they can contact you, learn more about you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the the uh, is our is our URL, and you can contact me at dan.perry at thebrevetgroup.com through LinkedIn, obviously, uh, and on Twitter, Dan Perry Brevet. So uh, please reach out if I can help anyone at all with anything. We love love the conversation and the interaction because I just love talking about sales. Excellent. And Catherine, how can people contact you and find out more about you? 
Sure. You can find more about bhyconsulting.com. Also, Twitter, Kat Brinkman, um, and LinkedIn, Catherine Brinkman. If you Google me, you find me. Email is cb at bhyconsulting.com. I like that. It's, just, it's a nice keep, keeping everything nice and uh, easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. And Ken, how can people contact you and learn more about you? Fabulous. Um, <clears throat> our company name is called acumenmanagement.com, acumenmanagement.com. Uh, my blog is yoursalesmanagementguru.com, yoursalesmanagementguru.com. Those are the easiest ways to find me. Otherwise, you can just look up Ken Thorson. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, I wanted to thank again, thank uh, uh, Ken and Dan and Catherine for being a great panel today, for all of you for joining us and for the people in the future who are going to listen to the recording as well. My name is John Golden from Pipeliner CRM and Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. Uh, you can find more events. You can find articles and interviews from some of the people on this uh, panel there. So I encourage you to go look at that. Um, and uh, and just a last comment here from uh, one of our one of our attendees, Alan Lee. He just said, "Very good webinar. Thanks to everybody." And uh, I echo that. Thanks to the panel, and we'll see you all for another webinar really soon. And in the words of Dan, just do your call planning, okay? No more excuses. <laughs> do it. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.